have sung about your faithful love and we acknowledge it. You gave us life and have sustained us. Your son Jesus has given up his life for us and redeemed us for you. In Jesus' name we praise and thank you for all your goodness. Father, forgive us our sins in the name of Jesus who paid our debt and give us your Holy Spirit to lead us into truth. May the truth of our salvation in Christ be as an anchor to us in life, guiding us to holiness. As we gather in worship, we pray for one another that we might grow in knowledge and goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm very pleased uh, to have been asked to pick the next hymn, which is When Your Anger Bold. It is based on Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 of the King James Version. Read from this verse, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. The words of the hymn were written by an American, Priscilla J. Owens. It dates from 1882 and is closely associated with the Boys Brigade Fight of the Year Giver. The BB badge is of an anchor which shows the words sure and steadfast coming from Hebrews 6 19. You can see the BB badge in the stained glass window just up the steps from the hallway at the back of the church. I think this is a great hymn uh, and it's wrong to everyone, not just those with BB connections. As to the meaning of the hymn, if an anchor is dropped, it holds a boat securely in stormy seas. Christ is our anchor, and he holds us securely in the storms of life. This hymn is a favourite of mine, and I haven't heard for a while, so let's stand and sing with your anchor hold.
Thank you to Ian for uh, introducing our opening him and later Jessica and Jason will also be taking part of the to them as well. The next hymn that we're going to sing also refers to the anchor that uh, Ian uh, was talking about just a few moments ago. And the second part of the, the song is You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. I'm going to sing this just once through and we'll remain seated as we sing it.
Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So, if the, church, if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who do not understand, or some, some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all, and the secrets of his heart will be made bare, so he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really on you. Um, thanks so much, glad you like this. Um, this song is called Build My Life and it's about half hour. And this song really means a lot to me because I want to say two years ago I went on a discipleship weekend and from then my feeling has changed. And this is where I really um, kind of saw my faith transform, my friend group transform, and just Christ was brought into my life a little more. And for the writer of the song Papara, this song also has a similar meaning. And it's when he who's gone through a really hard time in his life broke it and from then his faith became stronger. And I also picked it because I wanted to bring a woman song into the church. Because we always sing songs that are very old and while they're very nice. And I do like this one a bit better. And I hope you enjoy it so that I make this next. Psalm 51 and verse 10. 
or create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And so we will remain seated as we sing, Purify My Heart. Um, 
and those words echo through my heart. Um, reminding ourselves the sky, the sky, the sky, the sky not the grave, is our goal. Um, and Jesus gave us exactly that. By putting our hearts in his hands, we will have hope and strength in his name. Um, he gives us a future. Um, even though life, I'm sorry, I know it's happened to people, don't Sorry. But yes, um, scratch that. Um, but yes, this song is important to me, and um, and it's just a great opportunity for us to come together as God's family and um, and just be able to say with confidence that even though we go through the hills and the valleys, um, the Lord Jesus will walk with our son on our side, um, and He is the greatest friend we ever had. So um, let's all uh, sing this beautiful hymn together as one family and your Christians.
Good morning and a warm welcome to us as we gather this morning and especially if you are watching in video uh, later, uh, you're very welcome to worship with us. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Paul has laid out the real purpose and the meaning of gifts of grace, which is agape, love. It follows then, since the whole purpose of gifts is love, that the most excellent way to live is love. That in our use of our gifts, we would seek that which best helps others out of love for them. So the best gift for that is prophecy, the gift of telling God's message. Here it includes preaching and teaching and all other ways of telling God's message, all ways of strengthening, encouraging, and comforting others with God's word. On the other hand, the gift of speaking other languages, as the apostles did at Pentecost, can only address those who speak in that language. To anyone else, they don't know what it means, so it cannot help them. And the point and meaning of gifts is that godly, loving help towards others. Speaking in another language might provide some blessing to the person who does it, but only to them. In verse 5, Paul says, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather you have prophecy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. So while Paul would like everyone to speak in other languages, he would rather they could prophesy because that would help everyone. Of course, if the language can be translated for everyone, then that's the same thing as prophecy. The point is that the church can be built up and encouraged. That's the point, that the church can be built up and encouraged. And that is what Paul would rather they were all able to do. Now, brothers, he says, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? You see, you have to understand in order to be built up. Understanding is key. What good is it to speak in other languages if they cannot be understood? Even with musical instruments, the music has to be understandable, a pattern of notes and of rhythms, different notes in order to make a recognizable tune. And to get people to react uh, so that they uh, would listen to the alarm, the alarm must be sounded clearly. In other words, unless you understand what good is just noise and sound. You need to understand it. So it is, says Paul, with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. So you want to speak in a way that is understood, not in a language that cannot be understood. You see the point. If what you are doing is not being understood, then you are not helping. If you are not helping, then that is not agape love. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. You do not want a gift just because it gets you noticed or it seems to you supernatural. If speaking in another language, well, languages have meaning. They are supposed to be understood. And you want gifts that will help others, not just get you noticed. For this reason, Paul writes, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. So, interpret. But Paul is going to clarify this even more understanding is key. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. I suppose someone might pray in another language to impress people around them, 
or they might do it simply because God has given them that gift and they want to use it for themselves. If they are using that gift for themselves and they cannot translate the language, they themselves do not know what they are speaking. Then only in their spirit are they engaged and in their mind they have no understanding of the words and so their mind is unproductive and unfruitful for God. While they themselves might get some benefit from the practice, no one else does. And even they do not get benefit to their mind and thinking. And understanding is key. God wants us to understand. The transformation of our minds and our thinking, and so changing what we want and what we will, is exactly what God wants. Now, sometimes we might think that power is what we need. If we could actually move some mountains and cause the seas to rise at our command, then people would believe and the church would grow. Sometimes we think great supernatural power would be the answer. Signs and wonders. But Paul tells us here that love Agape, godly love, is the most excellent way. And that spiritual gifts are better if they help us understand and change our thinking. God wants our hearts and minds to truly change, not forced, not magically changed without our consent, but for our thinking and our willing to become righteous and really like his by our own choice and change understanding is key. So what shall I do, writes Paul? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. So then, by all means, pray and sing in another language if you are given that gift, but also and especially when you are with other Christians, Pray and sing in the language you and they know. Use your mind to think as you pray, and your mind to think as you sing. If you have no gift of another language, you might think all of this doesn't apply to you, but I hope you can see that it does apply to you. You need to pray with your mind and with your thinking. You need to engage in what you are singing and with what you are praying. Your mind and thinking is to be involved in worship so that you are worshiping. If you are praising God with your spirit, says Paul, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving? If you are praising God in a language others don't know, or indeed, if you are praising God silently, and so no one else can know what you're thinking, how then can they join with you in praising God? What good are you doing for them? How are you useful to their worship and their growing in God? When we meet to worship God, we are also here to help each other. We are to come to help. My heartfelt praise will help you praise. Your heartfelt praise will help me praise. <clears throat> but if we cannot understand each other, or we keep hidden our joy, what use are we to each other? We ought not to gather together to worship alone. I thank God, says Paul, that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church I would rather speak five intelligible words than 10,000 words in a language not understood. We want to stimulate and encourage each other's mind and faith and action. So we want to be understood. Better to speak as to be understood then. 
Brothers, stop thinking like children, writes Paul in verse 20. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. I put away childish things, Paul wrote earlier, with regard to love as the mature way to bless others rather than gifts. Indeed, love is the meaning and purpose of the gifts. Here Paul repeats the lesson, we are to be ignorant, innocent of evil, and with regard to evil, to just know nothing of it, to instead have a godly love. But with regard to thinking, we are to be mature. It is immature to think gifts are there for us, or that we are at worship for our benefit alone. Put away childish thinking and become grown up in your thinking. Gifts are given to the church so that one can help another. And you are at worship and gathering with other believers so as to help them. Do you realize that's why you come to church? Paul is going to give us some more mature, grown-up thinking here. In the law it is written, though me through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. This seems an odd statement. Why would God expect people to listen if he spoke through unknown language or through foreigners? Well, in fact, he doesn't. The reference is to Isaiah 28 and verses 11 and 12. Where since Israel had ignored God's prophets, God said he would send foreigners to tell them, and Israel were indeed brought under the rule of other peoples. The point was that Israel did not listen to the prophets and did not even listen to punishment. They were stubborn and rebellious. And Paul references this to show that we are meant to not be stubborn and rebellious. We are meant to listen and understand and heed what we are told. If we are heeding what God says, there is no need for him to use any other means to speak to us. Tongues then, says Paul, are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers and not unbelievers. So as speaking in another language by the power of the Spirit is a sign, and it is, it is a sign of warning for those who do not believe and who resist God and are not listening anyway. It is because they won't listen and demand proof or a sign. But even then, they may not listen. When at Pentecost, the apostles were given the power to proclaim the good news in other languages to all the different people gathered around them in the street, this was a sign of warning to everyone that the one they had crucified was in fact the Son of God. In the grace of God, many repented and began listening to God, though not everyone. So Paul's point is absolutely a mature, grown-up one. If you are listening with mind and heart, you need no warning and you need no proof. You are already paying mind to what God says. And that is the whole point. So in verse 23, Paul says, So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Now, says Paul, since tongues are a sign of warning for those who will not listen, what we actually want to do is speak to be understood so that those who will listen can do so. If we gather for worship and every one of us was speaking away, singing or praying in a language which none of us understood, and perhaps we didn't understand ourselves, wouldn't anyone who came in think we were all mad? In fact, people at Pentecost did think the apostles must be drunk or something, and then Peter stood up and spoke to them so they understood. The point is, we want people to know and understand so they can hear and heed God. 
But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everyone is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all, and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So if he, so he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Now if we gather and we are all prophesying, and then the person who comes in will be convicted. Let me explain that more, the idea of all of us prophesying. First, this is not everyone speaking at the same time. Paul tells us to have order in our worship, but it is everyone speaking, everyone, not just the minister. So how does that work? Here is how you might come to our gathering ready to prophesy, to offer the most excellent way and love. You might prepare by word, reading the word, and by prayer before you come. And I don't just mean on Sunday, but all the way through the week, listening to what the Lord is saying to you, paying heed and mind and walking and leading your life before him. And as you do so, you will be preparing for worship on the Sunday. For you will have something to say something to tell of God's work in your heart and your life to encourage another. When we come here, we can listen to each other. Listen so that we can learn what's going on in each other's lives and pray for each other, help each other, so we can listen. And we can pray for each other, there and then, here in the church, our elders pray before the service when we get the opportunity, and we try to do so. But we would love it if you all prayed for each other too. Sometimes I'll stop and someone will raise something and we'll pray for that there in the pew. And I encourage you to do so, to pray for each other. Come ready to help each other. You can share what God has been doing with you and telling you, share your life and journey. Paul wrote uh, that, he said, we came to you and we shared not only the gospel, we shared our very lives. We shared what God was doing and his work. And so we can share that. It will help others as we encourage them by telling them about God's work in our lives. So often we miss opportunities to do so and to help each other. We talk about the weather and about other things, and that's fine but there may be the opportunity to share what is going on in your life and to speak of spiritual things. And that is why we come to worship. When you leave, leave with the matters about others in mind, things they've told you, and take them to the Lord and ask if he wants you to do anything. Listen to the Lord through the service. He may lay upon your heart not something only for you, but for someone else. You can share it as something that the Lord has been speaking to you, and you never know how the Lord may use that with others. Come to prophesy, to tell the message of the Lord. If we each come to worship God, to help each other to God, and then anyone else who walks in they will find the people prophesying and blessing and living agape love. The Spirit will do the work of convincing them of Christ and their own need of Christ. God will speak to them personally about the matters of their heart before him, and they will respond. Remember Paul's point. If we are listening— and heeding God ourselves, there is no need for him to use anything stronger to guide us. We must listen and learn today then. You are to come to worship ready to serve the Lord with your words and your actions. The most excellent way to do that is godly love. And if you have a gift, use that gift also. Worship isn't about show and power and prestige. Worship is about loving God and loving your neighbor. You want to be useful in the assembly of God's people, and the best way to do that is love. Still, God does grant gifts of grace and acts of help and works of power to us so that we can be useful to one another. 
So if we want gifts for others, and we should, we should want the gifts most useful to others. When you gather with other Christians, come to be useful to them. That is worship of God and a pure will for him and a good conscience and a real trust. And it glorifies him. This is the purpose of our labor. See this and take it in. Why we rise each day and go to sleep early and look after ourselves or make a word garden of your home. It is so that your heart and trust in your heart in God may express its love so fully into the church and into the world so that when the day comes that Christ himself is revealed, it will be revealed that in the world with all its evil and all its sorrows, there was always good good procured by the blood of Christ. There was love of God for people and people's love to God. It was always there, and love never did abandon. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we bless you for that love that you have given to us and which has conquered our hearts and our wills, for you have given your Son for us and shown us godly love. Let us then, Lord, be willing to show that godly love, and even if we're afraid or we're uncertain, help us, Lord, to have a word for others, to lift our minds off from ourselves and out to others, and whatever little we think we may be able to do, let us at least do that. You have prepared good works in advance for us to do. And you've given us gifts and calling, and you've given us ways to help. Lord, let us be those who love, even as you desire us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing together, Church of God, elect and glorious, holy nation, chosen race. And this is what we are in God's will and grace in Christ. And that we've been thinking of the love that we ought to have as his people. Let's worship and praise him.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.